I think that what we've had uh, in the past day and a half is uh, the language of Pope Francis has been raised up. The language of Pope Francis is being used by Americans. In a, I haven't been at a meeting where people all talk about Pope Francis, yet let alone get up and read passages from him or talk about the quality of it or can use these phrases like um, the bureaucrat of the sacred. I will not forget that. I mean, it says so much. But the language of Francis is present in the way we're talking. We're appropriating that. Maybe that's the difference between talking about whether we're going to be talking to family or we're going to be talking about Amoris Laetitia. There's a certain way that that's a both end, that the, that the language that we learn to use of Francis is probably the language that is really comfortable for and receptive by families. I think that language is important. I think one term that really has struck me was, a, again, a t term that came up this afternoon, affective collegiality. As soon as I heard Archbishop Shakluna say that, I, sa I turned to John Strinkowski and I said, affective what? And he said, collegiality. That's a wonderful phrase because I think that's what's happened here, an affective collegiality. I don't think many of us have thought of theologians and bishops, for instance, as being collegial. We've thought of the theologians as being collegial. We thought of the bishops as being collegial, but not bishops and theologians being collegial. I think that affective collegiality is something significant. I think it's also significant if we understand just the dispositions with which we came here, the dispositions with which we came here. The, as somebody said uh, last night, the shields were lowered. The shields were lowered. And a generosity emerged. And a lack of defensiveness was present. And an actual engagement occurred. This did not happen by accident. We decided in the design of this project to think of, as Kathy was saying earlier about the, those who exclude, we were thinking of the includers. Who are the includers? Who are, who are people that we could have so that we could have an inclusive expression uh, and engagement about Amoris Laetitia? So that we could say, at one place, we had Americans from across the country discussing Amoris Laetitia. I cannot think of a place that has had a cross-national discussion of Amoris Laetitia, let alone using his language and embodying the dispositions that he calls for in Amoris Laetitia. That is this sense of real, true, um, uh, authentic discernment. How do we discern with one another? How do we have a pastoral conversion that allows us to a new way of thinking and being? We let Amoris Laetitia be heard. We discovered that there are nine chapters in Amoris Laetitia, that it's more than a footnote, that it's more than chapter eight. That as a matter of fact, chapters four and five were more frequently cited at this conference than any. And that it's there in four and five that we heard time and time again people going back to say, this resonates with real, another word that happened, or realistic as, as Archbishop, um, <sighs> this is what happens when you keep doing this. Uh, what Archbishop Gregory kept insisting on that we want to be real and realistic in our experience and in our engagement. I think that this is really rather important. It's, it's what uh, a friend of mine, John O'Malley, would say, style. Rhetoric is another. We've talked for decades about grammar. Now we're talking about rhetoric. All real theological formation prior to the modern era was about grammar and rhetoric. But we've been in the period of grammar for about two and a half centuries. Learning rhetoric is the language of engagement, of understanding, of moving forward. 
And so this language of Pope Francis is really rather important because it is a language that teaches us not a grammar, but really a rhetoric, a style, a way that we can proceed. I think that here at this meeting, the number of compliments that I've heard from people about this engagement, uh, any number of theologians cannot tell the bishops how significant your presence here has been. To say nothing of your receptivity, engagement, and compliments. When each of you have complimented a theologian, it goes around with a, an effect that people tell one another. But we are not known for complimenting you, <laughs> plenty, if truth be told. We humble theologians are kind of a little parsimonious when it comes to, have you done anything good? Do we have anything positive to say about you? I think this notion of affective collegiality has to deal with some sort of way that on both sides, whether you're a theologian or a bishop, that it has to be really an affective collegiality, that it's a collegiality of the bishops and of the theologians that's really rather important. Not ignoring the authorities or the competencies of each or the capacities there, but something about the quality of the engagement is really rather important. So there was a generosity here. That generosity allowed us to talk about families and to realize that that was the real point of departure of this conference. It's about families. That has come up time and time again. Whence our going to chapter four? Whence our being concerned about something more than whether people are in irregular relations, but to try to capture families? Or as Cardinal Farrell pointed out, if any document, <coughs> If any recent document is the most foundational of all documents for the exercise of true pastoral ministry, <coughs> it's Amoris Laetitia. I think that we have to understand what the function of Amoris Laetitia is in our church life. It is foundational because it is about family. That's what we've been talking about. The church is received, expressed, and lived through families. And so we've used the language, again, of Pope Francis, whether it's about accompaniment, whether it's about respecting consciences, whether it's about mercy, whether it's about realism. We've been using his language, but also our own language like outreach, language like implementation, to be able to say, how do we really move forward? So I think we became able, in trying to understand one another, able to understand more about family, able to understand more about clergy, so that we could talk positively about clergy formation and not negatively about clergy formation, to appreciate how burdened the clergy are, but also how we need to be engaged in, a, in an appreciation of that formation. In another way, we've also talked about many bishops and what we need to do. I think Megan Clark's point earlier is something that I can say, again, as she said earlier, we theologians are here to serve you. We're not interested in your authority or your competency. We're interested in serving you. I think that's very important. I think of myself rabbinically. I know a lot about the history and the tradition of, the, of, the, uh, of theology. And I think of myself that you can, just as you go to your rabbi, you can come to me. I'm not really of any authority, but I do know something about the tradition. And I think most of us would be willing, and as we've been here, at your service. Notice, and this is what I think for me is the most gratifying part, is not simply the way we engage one another, but the 15 presentations. The quality of those presentations was stellar. Uh, you, people would walk out, you should hear, like after, after Rick Galati, uh, Archbishop Shakluna turned to me and just said, superb. Um, now this is Archbishop Shakluna. He's not known for indiscriminate compliments. <laughs> <laughs> 
I realize this is on video, but it's appropriate. <laughs> but I, I say this just so that we appreciate how much ha energy has come into this conference. The amount of goodwill, the amount of competency, and the amount of affective collegiality. I think that's really rather central. So that when um, Bishop uh, McElroy talked about his experience of Synod, he was able to talk about something that we crushed into 36 hours, an engagement that was analogous to what he did in a long period of time with people he somehow was related to, and many of us, had, I, I could say, as, as one of the two organizers, uh, I knew half of the people in this room. Um, and whereas you knew many of the people who were involved, at least, it, and connected in the image of synodality. I just think that this notion of style, this notion of rhetoric, this notion of how we really are is rather key for appreciating what our church needs to be. We did not get here by accident. People are here because most of us have been anxious about the polarization in our country and in our church. No one came in with weapons. No one came in with targets. No one came in with anything but the hope to stop the polarization so that at least a document by the pontiff that dealt with family could be at least discussed in a positive manner. Just think of how minimalistic those expectations are. <laughs> that we just want Catholics together to talk about the family and a papal document at that. Why is it so hard in our country that we cannot have discussion of a papal document on family? Just think of that. I mean, just striking how, where we are as church and where we are as nation. There has to be something about our style, about whether we're affectively collegial, whether we're somehow trying to work with one another, appreciating the differences and appreciating the reality of the context. And so we looked at a document that tells us to pay attention to the specific complexity of individual family lives. And to say that pastorally, that has to be what is the way we understand of living out the gospel. To pay attention to the concrete, complex reality. I think this is central for how we can go. I think it's illustrative of the fact that we were able to discuss family in the United States as a Catholic church with the help of people from overseas. I think this is really significant that we had and heard what the people in the church in France, what the people in the church of Germany, what the people in the church of Italy ended up doing in terms of having their conversations about family uh, in this document, this apostolic exhortation by Pope Francis and how it was received. We also heard about how it was received in Malta. But to be quite honest, we were really not as interested in the Maltese as we were in Archbishop Shakuna. <laughs> there are people here in this room, we must remember, that in a certain way, just as the document came from Rome, we turned to people in Rome. We turned to a cardinal, a head of a dicastery, and had him speak to us about the work of his dicastery. Um, Archbishop Chiclunit is known as being the Archbishop of, of, of Malta, but he's also known as a man who is very significant in the serious discussions about the nature of faith and the life of the church in Rome. We've had people here who are actively involved in the synod, uh, whether it's Bishop Oberbeck, um, whether it's Cardinal Supic, whether it's uh, Philippe Bourdain um, or Cardinal Farrell being directly involved in a synod, two synods at that, there's a certain way that we looked beyond our frontiers. That we look not only to Europe, but we Americans who so think that we're way ahead of Rome 
found that, as a matter of fact, Rome was helping us to appreciate where we could be. There's something, a lot of irony here, once we get into affective collegiality. When our affective collegiality extends to Roman dicasteries, you may think this is a little odd, but I tell you, it's refreshing. That's what this has been. It's been refreshing. I don't remember ever having as a refreshing 36 hours as these. Thank you.